Hello, my name is Alex Isles, and in today's episode, I'm going to do my own alternate history if Rome had never invaded the British Isles. Welcome back. So, I hope you've watched part one, and part one I discussed my notes on Cody from Alternate History Hub's video on what would have happened if Britain had never been invaded by the Romans. So in today's episode, I'm going to do my own version. Now, I would like to say it is similar in some ways. I wrote my notes, um, obviously, uh, before watching Cody's video, and I'm actually quite glad about that because I didn't want to be too inspired, and I just tried to go down the rabbit hole of my mind to put together my own thoughts of what would have happened before the Romans invaded Britain. But I think there's some similarities because obviously there's certain things that are just basically occur or don't occur, but I've tried to go a little bit more into sort of some of the prehistoric Iron Age Britons, into some of the uh, Roman history, and also what I would have thought would have happened in the early Middle Ages and Middle Ages as well. So if you like the sound of that, why don't you subscribe right now? Because I think you'll really enjoy this channel and the nuance that I go to in British history. And why not we just jump straight back into it now and I'll get started. So, Rome doesn't invade Britain. Now, um, this is a really interesting one. So maybe there's failed invasions or Rome has no incentive. Let's suggest maybe even that the Emperor Claudius manages to win wars against the Germans, like his brother Germanicus, and therefore he doesn't need the prestige of invading Britain. Caesar maybe never tried to invade Britain, so because of that, there isn't the pre-existing um, sort of draw for the Romans to go, well, Caesar tried, and Caesar was the greatest Roman of all times, so let's try and invade the British Isles. So because of that, maybe Caesar didn't do that. Instead, he focused on his Dacian campaign instead. Or maybe he was taken up in more fighting in Gaul and maybe more fighting in possibly even Germania. And so because of that, he doesn't invade the British Isles. No matter what occurs, the Roman invasion of Britain does not happen. This results in a more centralized Roman Empire, which is quite interesting because it has another domino effect. Many people believe that Britain was just a poor, cold, wet province of the Roman Empire, but they don't take into effect that first of all, temperatures back then were slightly warmer than today. When they were slightly warmer as well, the east coast of the British Isles is actually a grain basket. And when it's a grain basket, it means that you can actually get food from here across into mainland Europe. And actually the Rhineland was quite underdeveloped. So you would need to supply food to there to the soldiers stationed on the Rhineland frontier. And we definitely have a fourth century source of grain being shipped out from Britain across to the Rhineland. So Britain would have supplied that. Alongside this as well, the Pennines in Brigantes territory had huge amounts of lead and silver. Wales produced gold, and alongside that as well, Britain had its famous hunting dogs, slaves, and other agricultural produce as well. As well as including to the Roman Empire the, um, the British boot and also the British cloak, which became fashion items in their own style and were exported over across to the Western Roman Empire. So there were influences from Britain that now the Roman Empire doesn't have. Because Britain isn't there to produce additional food, this puts additional strain on Gaul and alongside this on, as well on Egypt. And so I believe the Roman Empire would have had more of a focus on the East. When it has more of a focus on the East, this then for means that they're going to be involved in more wars against the uh, Persians, Parthians, and all of those states that exist in where modern day uh, the Middle East and Iran are today. So possibly even with great energy in that area, we see the Romans pushing further into Mesopotamia at an earlier point, and possibly also into areas of Arabia and also into other parts of Africa. Maybe due to the fact that they need to have more supplies, but I think obviously the Roman boundary in Africa would have been pretty stable. Instead, I'm going to suggest that the East is more of their focus. So we're looking at more of going into areas like modern day, uh, further into Romania, further into Eastern Europe, and possibly even to areas uh, pushing up into Ukraine from the Crimea, because there were obviously uh, Roman uh, states and colonies within the Crimea as well. So when we've got that going on, the Romans have got more of a focus on the East. 
We also see the Roman Empire being more stable because Britain had a huge amount of troops stationed in it. When it had a huge amount of troops stationed in it, this meant that Britain was very, very popular for usurpers, either because of uh, circumstances. So for instance, let's say the emperor betrays you and therefore you need to uh, quickly rise up and try and become emperor yourself or, or you're going to get murdered, or also because of opportunists. So because of that, when Britain is revolting against the Roman Empire, that causes instability, especially in the, the third century as well, where for a period of time, twice Britain was independent from the Roman Empire, first as a, the, a part of the Gallic Empire, and then secondly, as its own independent province and empire in its own right. So what we see there is that the empire is now more stable, but it's less wealthy because it doesn't have access to Britain's resources, and so it focuses more on the east. I'm going to suggest, therefore, that the empire survives a little bit longer, possibly into the mid to late 5th century, or even into the 6th century because of that. But it's still going to fall due to external pressures, um, due to the fact of, first of all, we in this, in this alternate history timeline are going to accept that climate change still occurs. So when climate change occurs, we see a cooler, wetter period, which then leads to disease, leads to pandemics, and other issues as well. So, you know, plagues are still going to come across the Roman Empire. We're still going to see migrations, and those migrations are going to have a domino effect that eventually result in the Germanic uh, sort of migrations or the Germanic wandering that are going to come into the western part of Europe. So that's still going to occur, but is it going to happen slightly later because we have a stronger, more centralized Western Empire that now the troops are able to be deployed into both the East and alongside that as well onto the Rhineland too. So that's why I give the Roman Empire more life. Now when I give it more life I still say that there is probably still going to be an Anglian migration. And I think that that is caused by uh, the fact that the area is going to become colder, wetter, more boggy, harder farming, and therefore the Anglians are going to leave southern Denmark. When the Anglican, Anglians leave, they're going to come into somewhere. Now I think it's going to be a lot more small-scale settlement, much more similar to what the Frisians do during the early Middle Ages. So we're going to see settlements along the east coast of the British Isles, and possibly also in Lincolnshire as well, just around here, just like we see in the late Roman period as well. So I think they still come across, but the native Britons aren't going to fight against them in the same way that they do in the late Roman history that we are used to. The reason why is because obviously in the late Roman period, what we're seeing is that the regional governments are inspired by the Romans. They're inspired by the Roman way of life. When they're inspired by the Roman way of life, they would have seen these uh, troops coming in as barbarians, or these people coming in as barbarians, and they would have opposed them and fought them. What I'm going to say instead is we see a very different British Isles. What we see instead here is what the rough geography of the British Isles is according to geographers like Ptolemy, who uh, was a Greek geographer who went through the British Isles and mapped the various tribes. And alongside that as well, there's other later geographers who go through and say where the tribal headquarters or leadership places were. So I think what happens is the Brythonic tribes who are living in the British Isles, what happens here is that they have um, a much more um, migratory sort of existence than we realise. Then maybe they have summer and winter homes. So during the summer they maybe go up into the hilltops and they farm in a more pastoral sort of way, looking after sheep and animals like that. And in the winter they go into the lowlands and rely maybe more on hunting and surplus. And so that would happen in Northern Britain especially. And in Southern Britain, obviously, you've got the agricultural surplus from wide-scale farming. But we're seeing probably every one mile a small little palisaded village with a light population throughout the whole of the British Isles. So when these guys come in on the coast, they're probably able to set up small settlements and then over time they're amalgamated into it. I also think that what would have happened is one of two things. Either the tribes continue to come together, maybe one tribe puts power on another tribe, but then they fracture again and so we're left with 30 to 40 tribes in the British Isles, or we see 10 to 15 tribes based on geographical areas, much similar to the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy or the Seven Kingdoms, or alongside that as well, we also maybe see them form a simile up in Northern Britain and what is today Scotland into larger groups. 
we don't see as a militarized British Isles because we don't have the Romans to fight against. So because of that, we're still seeing more small war bands, maybe up to 300 soldiers fighting against each other under tribal leaderships and occasionally coming together for larger scale tribal migrations or wars. One thing I loved about the alternate history hub done by Cody's video was he focused so much on the Brigantes. So it's possible that the Brigantes would have then, as a larger confederation, taken up more of central Britain. And so we see a large central British tribe, and then we see a large southern tribe and a large northern British tribe. And then the other tribes are sort of like under their control. And we see a free state British Isles or free nation where we have the northern, the central and the southern nation within the British Isles. Wales, I think, would have still remained maybe four or five separate kingdoms if they amalgamated together, simply because of the geographic nature of Wales itself. We also possibly don't see the Scottish migration in the late Roman period because of the fact that um, the Scotii were under obviously Roman influence. They, the actual name Scotii within the Roman text basically means pirate. So they were probably raiding across to get the benefits of Roman goods, Roman trade, all of that sort of stuff. So maybe there's less impetus. But what we do see is the kingdom of Dalratia over here in Northern Ireland still basically living between probably both sides of the west coast of Scotland and also Northern Ireland as well. And there's probably, just because of this short distance between those areas, Irish or what we'd understand as Irish migration between both these areas and Irish culture sharing between them. So that's my view of what the British Isles would be like in what we now call the Long Iron Age, because the Iron Age now extends out into what we would refer to as the Early Middle Ages or Dark Ages. So now we have all of these tribes. We have settlement on the East Coast, but much more lower of Frisian settlement and Anglian settlement, and it's more like trading posts and an amalgamation between those cultures as we would have seen in other migrations in other periods. Religion-wise, yeah, Cody talks a lot about the Druids, but I think that there are a lot more regional gods and maybe an evolution of uh, the understanding of the gods as well. So we get small-scale pantheons through Roman trading, and so from there we maybe see the adoption of Roman gods as well. Just like how in the Germanic peoples we see Hercules slowly mutating into four or parts of Hercules being adopted within four as well. So possibly that occurs over here too, where we see influences from the, uh, the Roman Netherlands coming across into the British Isles through trade. And so maybe we see like Mars being adopted as a local, uh, local god, such as we see in the Hadrianic period on the frontier up on the wall, and also into the Roman uh, third and fourth centuries where we see Bellotocardos and Cacodocus um, basically becoming more important and paired, synchronicious, synch paired with synchronicity to Mars and other deities like that. So there's a cool one right there. I do think Christianization would have still occurred in this alt history, and what would have happened is missionaries from the north of France would have come across from Amorica, which is obviously never becomes Brittany because we don't see a migration of Romano Britons across into there, and alongside the northern coast as well, but it's a lot slower. And so what we have next is a longer living Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire still breaks up, and I think there would have still been a king like Charlemagne. Now, when there's a king like Charlemagne, he's influenced by the Roman kingdoms. And so because of that, he unites together Roman Gaul. And he may have been Frankish, he may have been German. But let's just go with and say he's Frankish. Because let's say the Frankish migration still occurs. And that there is still a character like Clovis, who is able to bring a strong northern France together. And then brings together the situation where we can have a Charlemagne-like king. When we have a Charlemagne-like king, let's say he does unify those areas together, but now we're looking at something from about the mid-7th into the 8th century. Britain has been in the Long Iron Age now for 800 years, so we're maybe starting to see, the, as I said, the free regions, free regional kingdoms forming in what is today England and Scotland. When we have that, this Charlemagne-like king is probably inspired through uh, the sort of like warlike attitude that he has to do something very similar to what Charlemagne did to the Saxons. And when Charlemagne does his attacks against the Saxons, he then does a religious war where he is definitely motivated by his own expansionism and uses Christianity as a reason. And so when he uses Christianity as a reason, he goes in and takes over the Germanic religious sites and then causes for a religious war against the Saxons. 
So I'm going to say a Charlemagne like king sees the British Isles in a similar manner and when you've got the British Isles over here it's nothing like Anglo-Saxon England because Anglo-Saxon England was able to inherit the previous Roman structures and so we see places like regional towns eventually forming, we have taxation systems that they can basically um, mutate from the Roman systems, we've got uh, existing supply lines that sort of still exist even after the fall of the Roman Empire where we can see that there is established farming even amongst the post-Roman Brothonic kingdoms um, and all of that sort of stuff there. Instead, we're looking at the Iron Age system that may have improved over time through Roman influence, but we're seeing a much more sporadic population, much more similar to the Germanic tribes on the other side of the Rhine during Charlemagne's times. So you don't see a massively strong tax base in Britain. You don't see uh, like uh, strong... Um, powerful kingdoms and one of the things that made Anglo-Saxon England so attractive for later adventurers like William the Conqueror was because of the fact it was so wealthy and it had one of the most established trade systems in Europe as well as it was famous for its embroidery and other things like that. So that was an attractive kingdom to invade and take over because of its wealth. This doesn't exist in the same way. The tribes, even if they've united into southern, central and northern British kingdoms, what we have instead is that their economies maybe aren't as developed because they haven't inherited the previous Roman system. So that's a slightly different one right there. When you've got this uh, sort of thing, this Charlemagne-like king invades, possibly using religious warfare as an example, and conquers possibly the southern kingdom. But he's dragged into guerrilla warfare, but much like uh, the Claudian invasion, because of the geography of the south, he's able to take it over. And so he creates a Frankish kingdom in the southern area of the British Isles, but then over time, like the Romans, is drawn into further wars in the north. The north is going to be a real problem. Because unlike the Romans, they probably doesn't have legions and stuff like that. So just like in our history, when the Romans head into northern Britain, they have to militarize the area. And we see that the tribes both north and south of Hadrian's Wall and also the Antonine Wall don't necessarily like Roman intervention. So we see rebellions probably every 50 to 80 years within the British Isles. When we see those rebellions, they're incredibly taxing on the Romans. They're incredibly... Um, costly and they're also costly in manpower as well for warfare. So this Charlemagne-like king is drawn into these wars but just like in the Germanic areas that he's conquering he basically commits uh, just like the Romans um, basically war crimes, genocides, that sort of thing against the native Brophonic tribes and eventually forces a Frankish system onto them. I'm going to say that up here as well what we see is possibly a unification of the tribes in northern Britain and something similar to the Picts at the Caledonians and the Manet sort of forming up here. So we do get a kingdom that would reflect maybe similar to an Albia or a Scotland but in many ways it's not going to be the same. It's not going to have the same Gaelic influences because we don't see the mass migration of the Scotii across in, in the late Roman period because the Scotii have become stronger from raiding Romans from raiding the Romans and therefore are more economically able to develop war bands so we don't get a Scotland what we have is the northern British tribes who are basically exist up there who are probably not going to be called the Picts uh, basically existing and then resisting against this Frankish new kingdom when this Frankish kingdom exists, the Charlemagne-like king will eventually die and he is going to have um, a succession which basically results in his empire being split up between his successors and Britain is either given to one of his sons or it's part of one of the continental kingdoms. So just like in our actual history that we know, we have East Francia, uh, Lotharingia and West Francia and when we have those kingdoms, the British provinces either end up as a part of one of those kingdoms or they end up as their own independent kingdom. And therefore the southern part of the British Isles and possibly even the central part are dragged into Frankish warfare that will eventually see the creation of something similar to the Holy Roman Empire, either as a unified state or as the confederacy that we see within our own timelines. And so when we see that we have quite a strong Frankish Empire that maybe then is more involved in Spain 
getting more involved in uh, the wars against the, um, the Islamic kingdoms in Spain and a very different setup for Europe because we don't see the same wars between um, like the, the Hundred Year War between the English kingdoms and the French kingdoms over the kingdom of uh, over the French crown. What we might see instead is like a backwards and forwards of what between the sort of East Francia, West Francia, La Ferengia, and then eventually a formation of a kingdom. So I would easily see France extending into the southern part of the British Isles and into central Britain as well as a different sort of France but still existing and that sort of thing going on there. Now I don't want to go any further into history because the domino effect or the butterfly effect has gone too far and the ends are so different to our own understanding that basically I just don't think we can cleanly and easily say this in any way that's understandable to our modern minds or to any mind because it's so different from the history textbooks. But I'd love to hear your thoughts about what I've said about how my vision for a non-Roman invaded British province where Britannia doesn't exist and the Roman Empire is very different in many ways and we see a much more of a Roman Empire focused on the East. We see a long Iron Age period where we see uh, an artistic culture developed within the British Isles that's quite unique from continental Europe but is still trading with the Roman Empire and having Roman influences. We still obviously see the Germanic migrations, possibly a Frankish kingdom or another Germanic tribe taking over northern Gaul and then I do think a Charlemagne like king would have evolved out of that and then that's how I see the domino effect occurring through history to create something of a medieval kingdom in England but it would be much more similar to what we see with the sort of the French culture being imposed on Scotland in the 1100s and how that Gaelic kingdom then becomes more like a medieval French kingdom but still has its highlanders and all of that sort of stuff to contend with right here as well. So we see a Frankish nobility with a much more brophonic um, sub-people underneath it and that would have developed a new culture in its own way as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please put something in the comments. Tell me what you think and we'll have a chat there. But it really, it's a massively interesting one for me and I've very much enjoyed putting this together. If you haven't already, please do subscribe. And alongside this as well, if you'd like to financially support me, I do have a Patreon and a Coffee account down in the description. And if you'd like to support me, feel free to, but there is no pressure from me there. Alongside that as well, I really hope you have a lovely rest of your day and look forward to seeing you in another video in the near future.